Some months ago, a University of Toronto professor specializing in Indigenous health was a guest on this program. In the midst of one of her answers, she said something off topic, but quite provocative, that the government of Canada was essentially keeping Indigenous people in crisis in order to get unfettered access to their riches of their land. We instantly thought that would make for a fascinating debate. And so we'll have it now. We welcome Suzanne Stewart, Director of the U of T's Wakaban S. Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health. Tom Flanagan, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Calgary and author of First Nations, Second Thoughts. Linda DeBossage, former chief of the Chiging First Nation on Manitoulin Island. And Francis Whittleson, co-author of Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry, the Deception Behind Indigenous Cultural Preservation. And we are delighted to welcome all four of you Back to TVO for what I suspect will be a most enlightening debate. And I want to start by showing how it all came together in the first place. You may remember this, Professor Stewart. I think you had something to do with it. Sheldon, roll the clip. It's really not in the interest of Canada for Indigenous people to be healthy. Why do you say that? Because it's in the interest of Canada to oppress and colonize Indigenous people in order to continue to access the resources that are on traditional lands. You think the, the pursuit of those resources that are on traditional indigenous land, the pursuit is more easily done if the crown continues to keep indigenous communities in crisis? Absolutely. Canada was built on the um, premise that there's an Indian problem. Canada was built, everyone who lives here who's not indigenous has what they have as a result of the Indian Act, as a result of harm to a group of original peoples. Okay, that actually wasn't the topic we were supposed to be discussing that day, but it was such a provocative comment, I thought, we've got to get you back and we've got to have a bit of a discussion about this. So you had only about 20 or 30 seconds there to make the case that you wanted to make. Let's put some meat on the bone. Why do you believe that? Indigenous people's lives are controlled by a federal policy called the Indian Act. The Indian Act was created uh, in the 1800s in order to create a space for European settlement. Uh, that European settlement uh, was predicated on the idea that indigenous people had to be assimilated uh, through cultural genocide into Canadian society. And these were based on the views that indigenous culture and identity were inferior to Euro-Canadian Christian ones. Is it your view that that is still the Crown's view today? Well, the Crown's view might change in the media according to who's in elected position, but the objective and the view of the legislation remains the same. All right, let's get into this. Tom Flanagan, I take it you don't share that view. Tell us why. Now, first of all, it's always been true that any resources on or under a reserve were uh, for the benefit of the people who live there. There are various mechanisms for doing that. But more recently, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, in its jurisprudence on the duty to consult, has, um, has, has really changed the game uh, tremendously so that now resource development uh, in traditional territories, which are not legally defined, but nonetheless are, are recognized in practice, um, you know, oil doesn't get pumped out or uh, minerals aren't, aren't dug out, forests cut without consultation with uh, one or more First Nations who are close to there. And, uh, consultation or approval of? No, the Supreme Court has been clear that the duty to be, right to be consulted is not a veto, so there is consultation. But what typically results in is an impact benefit agreement, which um, will bring with it uh, some combination of cash, jobs, uh, job training, um, contract set-asides, and sometimes even equity shares in, in what's being done. Let me so just see if I can get, get cons good. consensus on that. Would, would, do you acknowledge that what he's saying is accurate? That when the settler culture wants the resources under, quote unquote, your land, a deal is done and the indigenous people benefit? Well, I think, you know, um, I'm, I think we have to take a bit of a step back from that, and that is looking at what is indigenous land and what are the original treaties that underpin the stuff that's going on in today's um, economic and political climate. Because in reality, predating these things that are happening now, all of the land that we're on is indigenous land. The original treaties that were created in order to provide benefits 
or compensation to the original occupiers of the land were not actually followed. So it's not only about what's on the land of reserves, it's about what's on the land of Canada and how that's being used. Let's go to uh, the former chief of Chiging First Nation. Uh, you heard the initial allegation from mm -hmm. Professor Stewart. Today in Canada, the government of Canada keeps First Nations in crisis Absolutely. in order to have unfettered access to their minerals. Absolutely. You believe that? Yeah, 100%. Um, it, it's, it's power and control, conquer and divide. You know, you, you continue to allow um, First Nations to be oppressed, First Nations to which there was a fiduciary responsibility to by the federal government um, uh, it, as representing the Crown. Now, we fail to look at in the gap that has been created over that, that amount of time, which has left our, our communities in, uh, in crisis, um, missed opportunities, or having industry um, run over them. You know, you talk about impact benefit agreements. Well, in some communities, they say that uh, and the industry chose them, they didn't choose the industry, which, which uh, causes me to believe that they had no choice. Let's go to Francis Widowson. You've heard the debate emerge now? Yes. What's your view? Well, I, I'm, I'm in partial agreement in the sense that um, I think ca Canada, is, uh, its history is one of a history of a capitalist country and the development of capitalism in Canada, which is a very exploitive and coercive system. Um, I get um, somewhat alarmed, however, when we start to look at all these problems through this lens of the past and historical grievances, legally created grievances, treaty nation to nation relationships, because I really don't think that's the way forward into the future which I think is trying to create a society where we can all live together on equal terms. And we really can't do that by uh, trying to look to legal agreements that were created 150, 100 years ago, because things have changed so much today in terms of the requirements um, as to what needs to happen in order to live together, um, to have meaningful lives, to have equal lives, to treat each other with respect. And I really don't think that there's much that we can gain by looking at various traditional legal agreements and having various lawyers make millions of dollars off of all these different grievances which arise out of those legal agreements. Professor Stewart, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the Indian Act continues to infringe upon the rights and freedoms of Indigenous people and continues to make us uh, wards of the crown, uh, wards of the state, whatever legalese language you want to use. Those, the, the Indian Act was created to get rid of Indigenous people so that the land could be used for whatever it was that settlers wanted to use it for. Tom Flanagan, should we get rid of the Indian Act and would that therefore make some progress in this? There's been legislation creating what you might call off-ramps from the Indian Act. Not total, but partial. A couple of examples, uh, the Kamloops Amendment of 1988 allows First Nations to create systems of property taxation, about 150 now have them. That allows them to derive revenue for their local government from taxing leaseholds like pipelines or utility corridors, things like that. It may seem like a small thing, but it, it generates useful revenue. Another one, uh, more sweeping, is the First Nations Man Land Management Agreement. Um, I can't tell you the exact number who are in it now, but uh, I think like about 100 have applied and dozens have been approved. And that um, allows them to um, manage their own lands uh, without having to have everything approved by the minister. As the chiefs like to say, it allows us to move at the speed of business rather than the speed of government. And it is leading in, in a lot of cases to uh, more productive use of the land and generating a useful revenue and a better life for the people who live there. These are some of the best known. There are some other ones. So uh, it's not as if nothing has happened. Uh, in a difficult political situation, there has been some incremental progress, and I hope there will be more as time goes on towards relaxing the, the shackles. But uh, abolishing or repealing the Indian Act uh, is easier said than done because there isn't you know, wide agreement on what exactly would replace it. So I think in the interim, we're left with, with these incremental changes. So we should be aware of them, at least, that they're there. Well, let's do one example here, water. We know there are boil water advisories in many reserves all over the country. I don't know if it's the case in Chiging, is it? No, not in Chiging. Not in Chiging. Mm -hmm. So you can drink the water in Chiging. You can drink the water in Chiging. Do, do you feel, though, that the government of Canada 
I don't want to put words in your mouth. I just really want to understand your position. Do, do you believe the government of Canada does not make adequate progress on improving the water filtration systems on First Nations reserves all over this country in order to keep First Nations in crisis so they can have access to the resources? I believe that um, First Nations um, are a financial exercise for the federal government. Meaning what? Meaning that um, significant investments need to be made. If we're just talking about water, significant inv investments need to be made on all First Nation when it, when it comes to water. Um, currently, um, we fall under a, a, a national First Nations uh, centralized or decentralized uh, protocol system, which uh, places Health Canada, um, the government of Canada, and First Nations as as the as as the people who are responsible for the water. Now, our First Nations are bound by what government uh, puts in their budget for us to um, adequately maintain and operate our, our water treatment plant systems. Um, I'm currently working on an initiative with the Anishinaabek Nation where our uh, needs assessment has found that when compared to uh, provincial standards, most of our First Nations would fall under a boil water advisory. But my question is, is that happening because you think the government of Canada not only doesn't care, but wants to keep you in crisis purposefully? Absolutely. Absolutely. They have known for years what has been needed and uh, they continue to refuse to provide the adequate resourcing um, for the, the, the maintenance and ongoing operation of the systems. This seems to me, Professor Whittleson, to be an enormous gulf between some First Nations leadership that believe that they are purposefully being kept in crisis in order to pillage the resources under their land versus the kind of progress that you have, that you and Professor Flanagan are reporting on here today. Well, so what, I, are we, what are we to believe? But I don't think there's been a lot of prog progress myself. I don't agree with, you don't share that view. with Dr. Flanagan. In fact, I think that we're on opposite sides of the political I'm spectrum. I'm always Steve. You know that. <laughs> um, but I, I really don't, I take issue with the idea that the government is intentionally trying to keep uh, Aboriginal communities in crisis. What would you put it down um, to? The, well, I think that the, one of the major problems is, is what I call the Aboriginal industry, which is the lawyers and consultants who make their living off of maintaining Aboriginal dependency in various communities. Uh, the government is trying to figure out its way forward. It's not doing a very good job. It's, it's often incompetent and it's trying to basically, um, you know, uh, transfer monies of various kinds. Billions upon billions of dollars are going to out in the with the intent of trying to solve uh, in the indigenous crisis, but that money gets siphoned away. It gets siphoned away through uh, land claims, court cases, um, the mis missing and murdered indigenous women inquiry, that, that is you know, $60 million. If you look at the staff of that inquiry, 10, there are 10 legal people on the staff of that inquiry, and when that inquiry is finished, there's still going to be the crisis that exists in those communities. So, so in but terms, but we'll know more theoretically, won't we? It'll just be people who are upset and who are grieving and who are putting forward their concerns about what's happened. That's not going to get to the bottom of why all these problems exist. And what we're talking about is a serious lack of adequate services which exist in Aboriginal communities. But anytime you try to provide those services, you have endless meetings, negotiations, court cases, legal wrangling, okay, let's see and you never have any services. Are you an outlier provide. on this one too, or do you agree with her on well, that? Well, I love Frances because she always makes me look moderate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I want, if I could go back, if I could, because on water, something really important, the, the current government, the Liberal government, has twice announced in their budget speeches that they're going to be spending a lot more on, uh, on the Aboriginal file, and, uh, and it, specifically with water. And I just wanted to ask the Chief whether this has become visible yet at the, uh, at the level of the First Nation. Are you seeing an increase in budgets and specifically an increase in, uh, no, in, no. in water? Um, we actually saw a decrease in our enhanced uh, water and wastewater funding uh, last fiscal. Um, in terms of the, the current projected budget, budgets coming into uh, the regions, they, they distribute them regionally. Mm -hmm. um, the well, the region, money is flowing out, yeah. so where's it going into? We, we've been asking the same thing. We've been asking the government, where has this money been flowing to? Where has it, where has it, being, has it been being used? Do you know? No. No, and, no and that's why I'm asking. Yeah, <laughs> we've been asking the same thing. You yeah. know, and, and that's disheartening. I don't know where the money is going, if it's going to studies, but grassroots, um, First Nations on the ground, we're not seeing those increases. Okay.
There's no doubt that indigenous people in this country have suffered. Now, whether you want to say that it is at the hands of the federal government today, purposely to keep them down in order to pillage their resources, is another question. But do you do you want to meet them halfway and acknowledge the the terrible history they've endured in this country? Yes, yes, I will. Uh, but I also want to look towards the future. Um, I guess in my recent research, last few years, what I've been trying to do is to uh, focus on First Nations, which are demonstrably doing well for themselves in terms of the Community Wellbeing Index, which is an amalgam of uh, income, housing, quality, uh, formal education. And it's more than just GDP. Yeah, it's not. It includes finances, but it's more than that. And uh, it's got to be good. It's it's uh, computed by the federal government, so it must be good. <laughs> um, I think it's you know it's it's something. It's a measuring yard yardstick anyway. So I've been looking at. Um, those that are doing better, demonstrably, according to that index, and looking for the common features. And, are these you know, your, your seven traits of the most yeah, effective reserves? Right. And, you know, and what right. I find are traits like taking advantage of the off-ramps, um, taking control of local affairs, taking advantage of economic opportunities. For some, you could almost call it community capitalism, engaging in uh, business through their band government as the, as the owner. Not all are doing it that way, but many are. There's different forms of it. But uh, I think there is demonstrable progress. Sadly, it's not for everybody. It's not even for a majority. But it's, it's significant, and I, I think we can, we can all learn from the progress that is being made on the ground. And, and I would say, and interestingly, it's not coming from the government telling them how to do it, and it's not coming from outside experts saying, hey, this is what you should do. These are the people themselves through their chief and council who are finding a path forward. So that's all part of the mix. Can I get Professor Stewart to say whether she agrees that significant demonstrable progress is being made today? Well, I guess that depends on how you define progress and who's defining it. So when we try to measure indigenous well-being and indigenous health or education or life even on a reserve, and we're looking at measuring that from non-indigenous perspectives and world views, it's not going to really make sense from an Indigenous perspective. So it's, it's sort of similar to, uh, to what was said earlier about the Aboriginal industry and the problems with the inquiries and the lawyers making money. And I think many Indigenous people would agree that these are problems because what the, uh, the, the Aboriginal industry and uh, these inquiries, say, into missing and murdered women, or even the residential school uh, inquiry uh, through the TRC or through any other Western body, is a reproduction of colonization and assimilation because these are indigenous or non-indigenous ways of looking at indigenous problems. Can I understand that? Does that mean you think the murder and missing indigenous women's inquiry ought not to have been called? in the way that it's being done. How it needs to be done is, should be determined by Indigenous people, by Indigenous knowledge keepers, by Indigenous elders. As opposed by to by the Government of Canada. That's right. The inquiry should be done in Indigenous ways, not in European, Settler Canadian, ways. European, Western ways. All of this should be done from Indigenous ways of looking at things. The, the, the indicators of wellness, or even uh, because I work in health, uh, we talk a lot about the social determinants of health. Well, the social determinants of health, or these indexes for measuring wellness, don't really fit for Indigenous people. Because Indigenous people have a different history, have a different culture, have a different identity, and have different definitions. If we want to really talk about how to measure wellness or success in Indigenous communities, we need to define wellness and success from Indigenous paradigms. Did you want to follow up on that? Oh, I just had a couple of comments yeah. from um, previous comments made. Um, when we talk about um, where, where First Nations have made significant progress, um, that's dependent on each First Nation. It depends on their geographical location, their access to urban settings, their, whatever their base economy is in that surrounding area. Mm -hmm. Manitoulin Island, for example, is based heavily based on tourism, which has which, which increases or decreases depending on the economy, how much people can afford to visit. And, um, you know, the, the bands in the Western First Nations, the, the report, Mr. Flanagan, that uh, you, I think this, this 
the successful First Nations. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those uh, uh, Western bands have a significant amount of, of land base. Um, you know, they, most of them weren't subject to treaties and are now in um, different uh, final agreements, such as the NISCA. Now, when we, when we talk about uh, the First Nation Lands Management Act and the First Nations Property Ownership Act, those, those pieces of legislation simulate um, what the Dawes Act did in the United States um, in the 1800s, where, where it, it, it creates a, an indiv individualized uh, um, ownership of land, which theoretically improved the economy or well-beings of the people. And, and that's similarly what the uh, First Nations Lands, Man Lands Management Act and the First Nations Property Ownership Act is based on. Um, and, so, it, so that supports a completely Marxist attitude where it says, you know, we all must be equal and um, in order to contribute to, to equally to the society. And then it, it creates different uh, classes where um, the haves have and the have-nots have not. Mm. And, and all of this put together from this Western view supports the, uh, the government by keeping our indigenous people poor and capitalizing on our on our poverty. But and one of the uh, forgive me, yeah. uh, former chief. But one of the things that I'm trying to get a handle on here is, you've talked about the seven characteristics that successful reserves have, and you have your metrics by which you measure them. And then I hear Professor Stewart, and to a certain extent Linda DeBasaga here as well, saying, "Well, hang on a sec. Those are metrics that are fine in your culture and your world, but they may not be the same as ours." Now, if we can't even agree on how to measure success and or failure, how are we making any progress here at all? Can you help me with that? Well, I, I don't agree that we, we can't reach a commonality in trying to understand what makes people um, fulfilled. That's what we're trying, you know, how can we have a society where everyone has a fulfilling life? That, that sort of idea. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, when we look at many of these communities, like, and I think uh, Dr. Flanagan was correct when he said, it's not even going to be a majority who are going to do well under th these tinkering uh, mechanisms. We have um, a huge number of indigenous communities which are living in areas which are not viable which cannot support a fulfilled existence, no matter what you do. And that's a huge problem. And that's nothing uh, to do with Canada keeping them there. That's no, it's, it's, their a, it's a real, no, well, it's a very difficult situation because the history which created it obviously was oppressive and terrible, but now we have to deal with things as they exist right now, which is how can people live meaningful exist, a meaningful existence in what is now Canada? And what that means is providing people with the services which will enable them to have a high quality of education, which will give them the healthcare services that they need, which will give them housing which is not moldy, which will allow water to be clean and to be drinkable, and that all can be done if you have concerted effort to do it and don't get tied down with all the legal wrangling, the, the, the comments about resources. Um, Attawapiskat, Patanjikum, these places, there are no resources in those areas. These are people living in a very marginal existence which really need to have these high quality services which they've never been provided okay. with because of all the legal wrangling. Time running out here, I want to get some comments over yeah. here. Go ahead. Um, there are many First Nations and, and territories who are, who are wanting to self-determine, who are wanting to um, get to that point of, of self-government. And, uh, you know, the starting off point is addressing the, those historic wrongs, the historic traumas. Without addressing the historic trauma, we can't expect a, a human being to actually want to move forward built on a history of distrust, hurt, and, um, you know, basically raping our lands. So, so we need to create that relationship first. And, I've read the works of, of both of yourselves, and I believe that you know when you combine that with the Anishinaabe view, you know you do have a lot of good research, but it's very, uh, very biased, very one-sided. And in our world view, the indigenous perspective, anything that we do to get us out of our poverty has to be First Nation-led and First Nation-driven, and not. What's biased about their work? Um, it's very, it's it's very right-wing. It it doesn't talk about environment land in the way we talk about environment and land or tr or honor or truth or humility any of those it's very capitalist it's very uh corporate and and it supports um
corporate Canada. It creates very good debates. And, and I think, um, you know, um, Ms. Ms. Widowson and Mr. Flanagan have been shielded by the veil of academia to be able to, to continue um, pressing um, what they talk about within their work. But is what they've said empirically provably false? Yes, I believe so. You wanted to add? I just wanted to add that, um, that, I, that I agree that there's a lot of overlap and ways that we can work together. But in order to work together, uh, the damaged relationship between Indigenous peoples and uh, non-Indigenous Canadians uh, needs to be addressed. And that is through what's commonly referred to nowadays as reconciliation, which is an act that's being taken up federally, provincially, locally, by schools, by school boards, by universities, by corporations. And reconciliation really means um, addressing the harms that have been perpetrated on Indigenous peoples by the systems in which we currently live and work. And for Indigenous people, reconciliation is about healing from our own wounds, from the trauma that's been inflicted by the policies that have affected each of us on a very personal level. I was told the other day by an indigenous person that we can't get to reconciliation until we first deal with truth and that there are too many Canadians who still don't know the truth. So is that job one at the moment? Well, that's really for the job of the education system uh, to, to educate its population about the history of Canada and that the history of Canada is one that is a dark history full of uh, human rights violations and harms that have been done through the Indian Act, which, going back to where our conversation began, was really what our country was founded on. Our country was founded on uh, an act and its policies that were designed with an objective to exterminate a population based on race. And the ideology of that act has been well internalized, as we can see by some of our panelists, well internalized into the psyche of individual Canadians and Canada as a nation. So it's going to take some time for individual Canadians and the nation to decolonize their mind from that, de from that colonial mentality on which our country is built. And many of our own people have internalized this colonial mentality because it's what we had to do to survive. Everyone should have the ability to participate in our uh, economy and society. It's a capitalist economy. If we want to change that capitalist economy, we have to transform it. But what you're going to see in these communities is many uh, children, maybe many young people with the serious suicide crisis, the fetal alcohol syndrome problems, do not have the ability to participate meaningfully in Canadian society. And many of these communities, these small isolated communities with no economic base, no hope for the future, there is no path forward in, the, in that situation. And they therefore have to do what? Well, we need to provide them with the high quality <clears throat> services which you need as a human being living in the world today. And it's not just Canada, it's the globe. It's, it's a worldwide system. We should be able to communicate with people from all over the world and work together to create a better future. We shouldn't be looking back 150 years to what our ancestors did to try to figure out the way to live in the, in the world today. Do you think they're doing too much of that? I think they exactly are. All the talk about Aboriginal spiritualism and going back to traditions and all these aspects are not meaningful to the youth that are living in the communities today. They're told, to they are told to do that by various consultants and lawyers and this is part of the grievance mongering. You don't think they, don't think they is, feel it? Well, I think they've been told that that's the way in which they're going to be able to live the life in the world today. And many people that I know actually pretend that they think that this is a beneficial way for people to live. Okay, to response live. over here. Yeah, I don't think you have a right to talk about First Nations wellness. You know, that has to come from well, the communities. I'm here to, no, to I'm, give I'm my talking opinion. right now. So I was a youth who attempted suicide three times. How did I come out of it? was my understanding who I was as an Indigenous person, as a woman, and I listened to my elders and I participate in ceremonies. Even as of today, I don't rely on the healthcare system of Canada. You know, I rely on the teachings of the cultural practices and medicines that I have learned from my grandmother. So when, I, when you talk about the suicide and, and what's best for our youth, identity is what we need for our youth. Identity is what's gonna empower them and make them strong. I'm 35 years old. And if I didn't find that in my early 20s, I would have been dead. 
If I waited for Canada to help me, I would have been dead. But when I turned to my elders, to my community, to my friends and my family, and asked for help, that's what got me out of it. So I disagree with you saying that going back doesn't do any justice. What we're trying to do is reclaim our identity and, and to, to allow our, our youth and our children to get, get that opportunity that I never had when I was young. So they're just getting that now, you know? And that's preserving our language, our culture, and our identity that ensure that we, ha we are a unique and diverse people of this country. We are the original people. Do we have to acknowledge that what may work for European settler culture in terms of repairing, in terms of making progress, may not work for indigenous people? I disagree with how that's phrased, is that we have people in universities today in Canada today who are from all over the world, from Africa, from Asia, from every single country in the world. We don't see them as having to go back to what they were doing 150 years ago to be able to survive in the, in the, in the world today. What we have to do is work together and figuring out how all people can live together a meaningful existence in the world today. Maybe that will involve them following their own path. But what I really uh, disagree with is prescribing that for all Indigenous people just because they happen to have Indigenous ancestry. Maybe they're not going to you know, follow the ceremonies and listen to their elders. That might not be helpful for them. Why do we assume that just because they're Indigenous that that's going to be the path forward for them. Let me give the two on the ends the last words on this. Do you want to pick up on that, uh, Professor Flanagan, and then Professor Stewart will give you the last word. Well, I'm hoping there's some, some overlap or middle ground here. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, healing through uh, re-immersion in the culture, and I mean, I believe in all of that is true. On the other hand, if you had tuberculosis, I would hope you'd get antibiotics for it which was not part of the traditional culture, at least in the form in which we have them today. So th there is a modern world which has conferred all kinds of material benefits on us, and I would have thought the goal is to um, have the First Nations participating in that modern world while retaining their own cultural background to the extent that they, that they themselves wish to. But I, So I think it's kind of coming together rather than being on separate tracks. Professor Stewart, last word to you. Well, there's just so much to say. Isn't there, though? Last word. <laughs> um, you know, there is an overwhelming body of research that shows that Indigenous young people uh, have a s desire to be involved in traditional culture and ceremony and language. Uh, and, and I think the reason that that's important um, in a way that's different from other cultural identities in Canada is that Indigenous identity, culture, and language was made illegal by the Indian Act. And that was taken away. And systemically, uh, people experienced systemic harm uh, due to being Indians in Canada. And because of that systemic racism and oppression, Indigenous people need to have the opportunity to reclaim those aspects of their identities, those, the cultural aspect. And I don't think there's any Indigenous person who is being forced to engage in their culture or ceremony. Uh, young people have the access to their culture and their ceremonies now that they may not have had at one time because it was against the law to practice their culture. Uh, there is, as you pointed out, just so much more to say. But um, that proverbial journey of a thousand Miles begins with the first step, and I've hopefully taken some of that here today. I want to thank Suzanne Stewart, Director of the University of Toronto's Wakaban S. Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health, and Linda DeBasagay, the former chief of Chiging First Nation on Manitoulin Island, Tom Flanagan, Professor Emeritus, University of Calgary, Francis Widowson, co-author, Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry. It's good of all of you to come into TVO tonight and help us out with this discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.